We are honored to have an esteemed speaker today uh, to address us, and I have an esteemed person to introduce him. Would the mayor please uh, come forth, Steve, and uh, introduce uh, Carl Cardino to us? I will do that. You know, when you think about business in Silicon Valley, you think about innovation, entrepreneurship, but another thing you also think about about businesses in, in Silicon Valley is the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, an association of almost 400 businesses. And when you think about Silicon Valley Leadership Group, you auto, almost automatically think about Carl Gordino. He is the face of that organization. He has led that organization since 1997. Worked for it for a few years before that. He's also worked for Hewlett Packard and worked as a staff to an assembly member, assembly member Rusty Arreyes. If anybody remembers him, he used to rep represent Morgan Hill. Uh, Carl is uh, very much into transportation. He has led three measures, successfully passed three measures for transportation in Santa Clara County. Uh, Governor Schwarzenegger in 19, uh, 2007 appointed him to the California Transportation Commission that he now chairs. He was reappointed by Governor Brown and he now chairs that commission. And he's um, in the process of a fourth initiative. Unfortunately, it will not be on this fall's ballot. It'll be a couple of years out, but uh, we are working on finalization of bringing BART through San Jose and other transportation projects that are going to impact uh, Morgan Hill as well. Uh, one of the things I, Carl did that's really great for Morgan Hill, started a run, the turkey trot, the Thanksgiving run on, on Thanksgiving morning. That benefits three organizations. The Housing Trust, which Carl is a co-founder of the Housing Trust of Silicon Valley, uh, Har uh, Second Harvest Food Bank, and Healthier Kids Foundation. And we in Morgan Hill really, really benefit from all three of those organizations. So I encourage you all to support the Turkey Trot. Um, Carl is a consensus builder. Uh, that he's got this fantastic reputation throughout Silicon Valley. He knows how to open doors in any city hall in Silicon Valley, in Sacramento, in Washington. Um, just a great guy. And uh, in his spare time, I mean, he's married, he has a couple of beautiful little girls, but he somehow has spare time where he does full Ironman triathlon. So it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce to you Carl Gardino. Mayor Tate, thank you for that gracious introduction and to uh, Pete Kutras, who I have a pleasure of working on an initiative in, in Silicon Valley. It's great to see you and Dennis Kennedy and others. I love Morgan Hill and I must tell you I rarely make presentations but when it's a Rotary Club that makes a request, I almost never say no. I have such respect for what you do in the community, and it's a delight to be back. Uh, you obviously have a poor memory, though, because you did have me about four years ago. I guess every World Cup season you decide to have me <laughs> as, a, as a speaker. Uh, and it's uh, an honor uh, to be here. I'm going to step out here without causing a workers' comp claim by falling down the steps. <laughs> But I was asked by Mayor Tate and Pete Kutras to talk a little bit about Silicon Valley's economy and the strengths and challenges to our economic success. Uh, so let me try to do that. We call this Silicon Valley's secret sauce. Am I aiming at the machine over here? Great, thank you. The impetus for this is really from our founder, David Packard, the co-founder of Hewlett Packard, when he brought together people like Bob Noyce, the co-founder of Intel, Jerry Sanders, the founder of AMD, and 30 other Valley visionaries, he said, we're successful alone. When it comes to building a stronger region, we can be even more successful together. So 38 years ago, he formed what is now the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, and when the media reached out to him, they asked him why a David Packard would need a group to get anything done. And this was his response. 
Our job as CEOs is not to sit on the sidelines and either cheer or jeer. Our job is to get into the game and move the ball forward. To me, that sums up Rotary's job as well. Well, whenever I'm asked to talk about Silicon Valley, the first thing you have to do is try to define it. And that's the age-old question of what is the geography of Silicon Valley? 30 years ago, in an interview with the editorial board of the San Jose Mercury News, David Packard's partner, Bill Hewlett, was asked that age-old question. 30 years ago, his response of what is the physical geography of Silicon Valley? Santa Rosa to Monterey. Yeah. Well, I will never be as visionary as a Bill Hewlett, but we've always defined it as San Francisco, San Mateo, Santa Clara, portions of Alameda County, and portions of Santa Cruz County. All told, 2.4 million people, more than a million jobs, more than 7,000 high-tech companies, 2,700 bio and med tech companies, hundreds of clean and green tech companies, scores of VCs, and financial institutions. What's nice that we see trending again is our unemployment rate continues to shrink and we're leading the nation once again in recovery. Silicon Valley, as we define it, has a 5.5% unemployment rate, while the nation's is at 6.3%. California as a state is still lagging behind a bit at 7.3%. Oh, forgive me, 7.6%. Well, I was asked to talk not only about the economy overall, but what are those strengths that so many waves of innovation continue to break upon our shores? Because that is not by coincidence. It's because of the strengths that we collectively bring to this region. I like to refer to them as these six, the secret sauce of Silicon Valley. Talent, technology, temperament, training, treasure, and temperature. Let's start with talent. The strength of our region is that it's global. It's educating kids from right here in our region who can compete for these jobs, as well as bringing in people from throughout the world who want to be a part of this success. And that global strength of having talent from around the world is something we never take for granted. In fact, 53% of engineers that fuel our companies here in Silicon Valley weren't born in the United States. More than 50% of the companies created for the past 10 years in Silicon Valley. Either had a co-founder or the CEO who wasn't blessed to be born in the United States. More than 50% of US college instructors of technical degrees weren't born in the United States. And more than 50% of the students earning those technical degrees weren't born in the United States. It's a real strength, not only of this nation's history, dating back, as we heard, 238 years, but truly in Silicon Valley's history, its presence, and its future. And you know some of the names. From my generation, think Andy Grove of Intel. <coughs> Later generations, think uh, Jerry Yang of Yahoo. Today's generation, Sergey Brin of Google. The list goes on and it's a strength. The second is technology. And you think about those waves of innovation. Started in the 1930s, didn't it? With aerospace defense, and then semiconductors, and personal computers, and software, the internet, green tech, smartphones, electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles. It continues to happen here. The third is temperament. Friend of mine, Enrique Salem used to run Symantec, and he had a phrase about the competition. We can't afford to burn bridges in Silicon Valley. It's not just that today's customer, today's competitor might be tomorrow's customer, it's that today's competitor often, because
because we're in so many lines of business, is also today's customer. It makes headlines when one CEO trash talks another CEO. And that's unusual and it's unique. You can barely go to a Starbucks or a Pete's or anywhere else in Silicon Valley without seeing folks, young and old, sharing business plans and ideas with each other. We give each other a leg up, and it's unique to this region. Matter of fact, that friend on Rike Salem has sayings for it. We don't have enemies, we don't have friends, we have friends. We don't compete, we don't collaborate, we have co opetition It's a constant reminder that we work together and we're all successful. The fourth is training, and this is such a stunning attribute to this region. The Economist magazine, about every two years, ranks the best universities in the world. The entire globe, every edition, three of those top universities are right here in our region. Stanford, <coughs> UC Berkeley, can you guess the third? Those are great universities, but that's not the third. I heard San Jose State, I heard Santa Clara, I heard University of Phoenix. UCSF. Gavlin. Yes. Think bio and med tech. UCSF. Well, as a proud Spartan from San Jose State, though, I would remind you, San Jose State turns out more engineers that work for Valley companies than all the other universities in the region combined. We are blessed with amazing universities in our community colleges, CSU, UC system, and our private universities, and it's a huge strength to innovation. The fifth is treasure. Venture capitalists continue to place their bets, putting their wallets where their words are, on innovation here. These are very fresh numbers, Q1 2014. More than 50 cents of every dollar invested in venture capital in the entire United States is here. There's only two other regions in the country that are even double digit. That's how strong it is. The next closest is only 11% and then 10%. Anyone care to guess those two regions? In Texas, North Carolina, North Carolina, North Carolina and Boston. Austin and Boston. Yeah, those are great regions, too. Texas, 6%. 6%. Raleigh, Durham. Yeah. Less than 6%. Boston. New York. New York. 11%. Chicago. Chicago. About 5%. Good region. New England. Just think Boston. Yeah. About 128. 50 cents of every dollar here. And then finally, temperature. More than 300 days of days like this, average temperature 72 degrees, almost no humidity. Let's face it, the weather does not suck. <laughs> there is a reason you're visiting from Arizona. <laughs> and I love Arizona. <laughs> now, if our only strength was weather, we'd be crushed. But when the other five T's become before temperature, it makes for a unique region where decades now we have led innovation in the world. We also have to recognize and work on our weaknesses. Because when you get cocky, as Andy Grove reminded us, it's okay to be paranoid. When you get cocky and stop paying attention to your competition, that's when you lose. There's a reason that cars have a big piece of glass to look forward and to be visionary and to go ahead. But they also have those side mirrors so you can see who's sneaking up on you. And that back mirror to see who's behind you. They're smaller because you're focused on the bigger vision but they still exist, and they need to. We annually, for 12 years now, ask our CEOs, 222 respondents last year, combined annual global revenue exceeding $3 billion just from those 222 
companies. What are the biggest challenges that you face as an employer competing globally from here in Silicon Valley? Top concern of businesses, housing costs. We ask them, what do you hear from your employees is the top concern? Hey, alignment, housing costs. You look at that list, the third bullet, traffic for employers, third bullet for their employees, traffic. You see tax and fee rates across the board. What's good about having alignment? When the issues of concern in boardrooms are the same issues of concern to employees in their living rooms, we have an opportunity to work on them together. That's why our top concern is right now to make sure we continue that talent pipeline with a great education system here at home and an unbroken immigration system to continue to draw the top talent from around the world. I'm going to freeze frame there for a moment. The United States is 5% of the world's population. How presumptuous would it be of us to think that only the best talent was blessed to be born here? when 95% were not. We want to educate the best we can to compete for our jobs, to create companies, and move innovation forward. And we want to attract the best talent from around the world. That's always been America's success and Silicon Valley's success. We're going to continue to work on thoughtful immigration reform. The next two, the basics. People have to afford a place to live. They need to be able to get around on our congestion roads and our lack of public transit and other ways of moving through our region. We started a few minutes late. I'd rather get to Q&A. Would you mind if I just move forward and we get to that? I'll end with this slide. We use this a lot with policymakers because most elected officials in Sacramento and D.C. who are full-time policymakers have very little private sector job background. Very smart, very creative, often incredibly hardworking people, but that's just not their background. It's usually more public sector and public service historically. We try to remind them that a job matters. So we use these examples. And this is from the state's own uh, economic development department in the LAPDC. One job in electronic computer manufacturing, one job, creates eight more jobs, indirect and induced. Those nine jobs, combined salary with wages and benefits, exceeds $800,000, of which nearly $115,000 is returned for state and local taxes and fees for the infrastructure we need and the social services safety net that many in our communities need. One job in our driving industry, in high tech. And again, that wasn't an executive job. Biomed tech, same thing. Pharmaceutical preparation manufacturing. One job, seven more indirect and induced. Combined wages and benefits over 700,000, 100,000 plus in those taxes and fees that go back to government to provide those essential services. One job. And that's why the work of the leadership group is to make sure that we address the quality of life issues that attract and retain families and workers and those bottom line business issues that are going to keep us successful. With that, let's save the last nine minutes for question and answer, shall we? Thank you for letting me join you today. Thank you wanted me to talk on the economy, but we can talk on any topic that you would like. Yes, ma'am. Well, it seems that Texas has been really aggressive in going after business um, and helping the businesses in particular. What's being done to counter that? The question, if you couldn't hear, was Texas continues, mainly Governor Perry to be very aggressive and outspoken about competing with California. There are two schools of thought on this. 
And, and I find them both fascinating. One is, well, we're losing to Texas, let's become more like Texas. Fair enough. Or two, Texas is terrible, don't worry about it. I, I think those are both wrong-headed. How many of us are business owners? Do you get to pick your competition? No. I've actually heard high-ranking elected officials say, well, Texas isn't our competition. We lose more tech jobs to Texas than China and India combined. Anyone who says that that means they're not our competition, like they have a magic wand, is kidding themselves, or really isn't from the private sector. Everyone is our competition. I like Andy Groh's motto, that it's okay to be paranoid. <laughs> Because you stay sharper when you know you have competition. So look at the strengths that Texas has. Pretty low tax rate, uh, pretty um, streamlined regulatory process. Those are strengths. But also know there are some weaknesses inherent uh, with the Texas model. Account for the strengths. Note the weaknesses. And course correct is needed. That is the approach that we see our companies use. And for the strengths they have, if they fit what we should be doing in California, try to adopt them. But that doesn't mean they all will. Now we compete with regions throughout the country and regions and nations around the world. And we have to take them all seriously and learn from those models. There's a tiny island called Singapore that does incredible things right. And they shouldn't, because it's this tiny island. But they learned a long time ago, if they were going to compete and care for their people, they started with manufacturing. They're much more on innovation now. Whenever we can meet with the Singaporean ministers about what they do, not only do we meet with them, but we try to bring in policymakers too, so that they too can learn from them. Not where you push people's heels back and they're no longer listening, but where you're imparting information that's going to help California and the region. So don't be intimidated by the competition, but don't ignore them either. Yes, sir. Brian? Seems that once the manufacturing jobs left California from the Silicon Valley region, it's when you heard more talk about the gentrification and trying to drive up wages and the service workers which seems to be creating more issues with cost of living for the employees in, in the tech world. Are you seeing that trying to come back with bringing that back so that the less skilled workers are able to benefit from the Silicon Valley economy rather than trying to get $15 an hour working at McDonald's? Brian's question, if you couldn't hear him, is excellent. And it's really based on when manufacturing became not competitive to do in a large way in Silicon Valley. There are exceptions. I think of intuitive surgical, the Da Vinci uh, robot, the surgical machine in Sunnyvale that has hundreds of manufacturing jobs that pay wonderfully well. Uh, Infinera, a small company in Sunnyvale that manufactures here. KLA Tencore still manufactures about a billion dollars a year here. But your overall point is... Tesla. Yes. Um, just shout out any company you want. Like. <laughs> uh, so there are exceptions to the rule, but your point is accurate. It is very hard competitively to manufacture en masse, not only in high cost Silicon Valley, but in California and the United States. Are there steps that we can take, especially in advanced manufacturing, and should we take those steps? Yes, we absolutely should. Some of those are policy driven too. We have to get through this thought, and when Pete was running Santa Clara County, he was always a great partner on this, that there's somehow a competition. I mean, government's role truly is to make sure that, uh, to help make sure that businesses are good stewards, but also there's so many opportunities to partner together so that businesses can do what they do best, which is innovate, create, and provide jobs through their innovation and creation. Um, but it's going to take strong leadership and it's going to take it at the state level as well as the federal level in terms of manufacturing. It's a huge challenge. Yes. Carl, could you talk about Silicon Valley and uh, South Valley's uh, connection to it? I mean, we are part of Silicon Valley, but there seems to be this Coyote Valley wall. And how could we maybe turn that into a bridge and maybe 
encourage high tech companies to come down here and, and build bases down here. And we've seen great examples of high tech, uh, primarily in Morgan Hill, Les and Gilroy, as you know. Um, Jack, you have an answer for this one? No, no. I, I, I think uh, Morgan Hill is a, is a well kept secret. And uh, I was just mentioning it, Dave, there was a great article in the Mercury News uh, just a couple days ago. Uh, in fact, yeah, yes. your mother-in-law is a certain fault. But uh, great, great article on, on why I think everybody in this room lives down here and yeah. works down here. Um, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know why, from an industry standpoint, more don't migrate down here. We're only 30 minutes away from a large airport. Mm -hmm. um, the cost cost of doing business down here, I'm sure, is much less than 20 minutes up the road. Um, I I don't I can't explain it. It's 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 a it's a well kept secret. And yeah. We're 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 enjoying it, certain aspects of the secret yeah. down here. And let me share. That's really helpful because Chuck, as a CEO, has a, a great pulse on this. What we see is that the clusters of high tech, the clusters of bio and med tech, the clusters of renewable, uh, clean and green tech, they tend to migrate around each other. And that competition makes them stronger, but they are in the same community. So if you look at the uh, strong pattern north in San Francisco, uh, that's not manufacturing, that's not hardware. What is attractive in terms of the clusters of tech in San Francisco are three or four clusters that are doing really well and they like being located near each other. If you look on the peninsula, you see a lot of bio and med tech. They foster that environment by being near each other. You come down here, you see here being um, Palo Alto to San Jose, you see a lot more um, of what's left of manufacturing, but also hardware companies, etc. They like being together. It, it's hard to just start a new community because there have to be trailblazers that start there and others that grow around there. But you have great companies here that are very innovative and they don't have to be tech. Think of Mike Sinyard that specialized in the work that they do. They're the global leader in bikes and bike components and Ritsu is here and others. Uh, so in terms of breaking down that barrier, will that happen? It could, um, but continue to play to your own strengths as well. One more question, Carl. Oh, okay. Dennis Kennedy. Mm -hmm. uh, in answer to that, the question about uh, why uh, is it kind of a deterrent for some companies to come to work in hell? I was in San Francisco sitting at the Buena Vista with a bunch of young professionals, I said, would you ever be interested in working in Morgan Hill? And the answer was, well, what's the nightlife? What, what's this whole uh, environment that would, that would cause us to want to be in that community? It's great for raising a family, but for the young employees wanting to work together in environments and go out and have fun, it just seems like that was a real, what I heard from them was that was a Detroit. It is. Um, but remember, different clusters of tech attract different types of workers and at different points in their ages. I love San Francisco. We, uh, more than 100 of our 392 members are physically based in San Francisco, uh, if not headquartered in San Francisco. Uh, so we're a regional organization, but I feel for San Francisco Mayor Ed Lee. They don't have the housing stock they need. Traffic is terrible, and their public education system is really in a rocky place. My I, I have a friend on the San Jose City Council named Sam Ricardo, and he teases his friends in San Francisco. San Francisco is for gamers. Uh, Santa Clara County is for grown-ups. <laughs> So there may not be 24-7 nightlife, but that's not what you always want when you migrate out of your 20s and you want to get away from a dorm-like existence of five, six people in a $3,500 a month apartment in San Francisco and you want to start a family, you look for communities like this.
Thanks again for having me with you. It's been a real honor to have uh, Carl here. There's nobody who's more of an authority on business in Silicon Valley than Carl Gardino. Anybody that knows David Packard, boy. Well, Carl, we want to thank you for coming to share this information with us. And we honor you with another plaque if you want to do that. But more importantly, you probably know that Rotary has taken upon the job since 1987 of eradicating polio from the entire face of the earth. And at this point, we are this close from accomplishing that. Only three more countries remain that have endemic polio. And so in your name, we are making a donation to the End of Polio Now Foundation so that your speech, your presentation will have cause for the inoculation of several several dozen youth in the underdeveloped parts of the world. So thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, um, that's almost a wrap. Thank you.